I got a comment on one of my YouTube videos a while ago where someone was asking if I could go over fingering nuances and sort of common issues that we have with fingerings on the bassoon. And I also thought I would include in this video sort of tied to this topic, issues that I commonly see with my students related to fingerings and, and how we're playing things on the bassoon that I feel like I'm constantly talking about asking them to change. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the whisper key, which is a common mis thing that is missed out on in fingerings, and I'm going to talk about why, why we need to use it and when it's supposed to be used. I'm going to talk about the resonance key and the left hand pinky that is commonly missed on a bunch of notes. I'll talk about thumb placement, both, both thumbs. I also am going to talk about half holes, how to use half holes on certain notes on the bassoon because that is a super common big issue that we come across. And then finally I'm going to talk about um, venting and flicking on the bassoon. I think everybody can benefit from what I'm going to show you in this video, so stick around to the end and see what I find to be the most common fingering issues and things that I'm talking about with students and that we make mistakes on. So the most common fingering mistake that I find with beginners is knowing when to use the whisper key on the bassoon. So the whisper key is this key right here. So the whisper key is kind of a funny key on the bassoon. If you're familiar at all with other woodwind instruments, most other woodwind instruments have what's called a register key or an octave key that helps them play in the upper register or in the upper octave. The bassoon doesn't have anything like that, but we have sort of an opposite octave key or an opposite register key. The whisper key is primarily used to help with response in the mid and lower registers. So the whisper key is used on all notes from A flat F or G sharp at the top of the bass clef staff on down. Eventually you might ask, well, what about the fingerings that are in the, the lower octave of the bassoon that are, uh, say, low E below the staff and, and down? What about those notes? Because you have to use your left thumb to press down other keys. In those instances, you're switching off the whisper key for the pancake key. And you might notice if you look at your bassoon that the, the whisper key and the pancake key both connect to this key up here on your vocal. And that covers a little hole on your vocal and that helps with response in the lower register. So on the notes where you're playing in the low register and your left thumb has to play another key besides the whisper, besides the whisper key, your right thumb is sort of taking over the role of the whisper key. It's essentially doing the same thing. The whisper key pad stays the same. So a common issue with this is that students tend to forget the whisper key, especially when you're switching between notes where you don't have a whisper key, two notes that do have a whisper key, you forget to put it down because seemingly you don't need it most of the time. A lot of times you can play those notes without the whisper key down, um, but the whisper key helps with response on a lot of those notes, so you do need it. And of course, for the very low notes, if the pad isn't covering that hole on the vocal, then your low register will not speak. Related to that, if you are in the low register, and your notes aren't speaking. One possible culprit for that may be when you're putting the pancake key down for the low register, that for one reason or another, that key isn't hitting the pip on the vocal, and that would be why it's not responding in the low register. It's also an important reason, this is, we're getting a little bit outside of fingerings here, but it's an important reason for why you want your vocal to line up with the whisper key pad. So that's kind of the whisper key issues in a nutshell. Make sure that if you are playing a fingering that requires the whisper key to be pressed down, that you are actually doing it, even if it doesn't seem like it's important. I promise you down the road, using that whisper key helps out a lot. Another key that I find to be a common issue with fingerings that's missed is the resonance key. The resonance key is on the long joint of your bassoon, but it's played with the left pinky. So this is your left hand, left pinky. That resonance key is really important for some specific notes. G at the top of the bass clef staff 
requires that left pinky to be put down. The resonance key is also used for a number of higher notes on the bassoon. So E above the staff and upwards, most of those notes require the left hand pinky on the resonance key. And it's another one of those where you can get away with playing the note without it a lot of times, but if you play with and without it, check that with a tuner and you'll probably notice that with the resonance key a lot of times the note is a little bit more in tune and you'll probably also notice that the the tone the timbre of the note is better when you have the resonance key down so again if a note is supposed to have a resonance key on it make sure you're using it even if it seems like you don't need it and you might have come across a fingering chart that doesn't list the whisper key for that G or um, it seems to be missing the resonance key or, or other keys for certain notes. There are a lot of really bad fingering charts out there, especially in band method books and, and other places as well. So you have to be careful that you're getting a fingering chart from the right source. Um, I have included a link down below to my own fingering chart where I actually have pictures of the bassoon and the, the fingerings overlaid over the pictures, which I think is helpful, especially when you're a beginner and seeing what it actually looks like on the bassoon. So click my link below and you can get my fingering chart. The next sort of common fingering issue that I come across with my students is regarding to thumb position. So right thumb and left thumb. And both the right thumb and left thumb are doing different things. They're not necessarily related to each other. But with the right thumb, I, my issue with this isn't typically with a specific note, but where your sort of home base position is with your right thumb. When you're looking at the bassoon, a lot of students will, will put their right thumb up here instead of on this B flat key. Um, so this would be where your right thumb is going and I see it sitting up here a lot. So when you're not actively pressing this a key down with your right thumb, you want it to just sort of hover above that key. This is a really common issue because if your thumb is having to move from above the key down to whatever key you're gonna play, that's a lot of thumb motion that you don't need. And when you have to start to play more technical, faster things, it gets difficult to move the thumb that quickly. So you wanna have the thumb and really all your fingers kind of in their home base positions, just hovering gently above the key or the tone hole that they're playing. So that's a really common right thumb mishap that I come across. With the left thumb, there's a lot of things that we do with the left thumb and I'll get into these even later in the video. With the left thumb, I often have an issue with how students are moving down to the lower octave. A really common issue is that students will have sort of this sort of motion with their thumb instead of sort of rolling around on the keys, which is a more sort of ergonomic and efficient way of moving around on the keys. Because especially when we're talking about fast technical things in the low register, you need that left thumb to be really agile. So if you can sort of slide around on the keys in a way that is efficient and you're doing as little motion as possible, you're not doing any weird wrist turning or arm turning or bassoon turning, you're just being as efficient as possible with that left thumb, I promise that that is the best way to do it. So another common issue that I come across is issues with the E flat, the forked E flat fingering in the middle of the bass clef staff. Essentially it boils down to whether you're playing short E flat, forked E flat, where it's just one hand, or you're playing full E flat um, or, sh or long E flat, uh, which involves the right hand as well. So just to show you on the bassoon, short E flat is gonna be one, three, resonance key, and then whisper key in the back. Long or full E flat could be one of two options. It would be the forked E flat, no resonance key in your right hand. You've got either this finger down or this finger down, one or the other, uh, depending on which E full E flat you're fing fingering you're playing. And then you also, in your right thumb, have the B flat key down. My go-to E flat fingering is generally 
the full E flat with the first finger, although I go back and forth between using that one and the short E flat. I, I rarely use the one where I'm using my middle finger. So in short, those fingerings, there's multiple different E flat fingerings and that particular fingering is one that is almost always messed up in beginning books in the fingering chart. So I highly recommend that either you use my fingering chart or another fingering chart that you trust um, to make sure that you're using the right fingerings for those E flats. Um, that E flat can be really unstable, especially when you're using the one handed or short E flat. And so if you find that it's unstable, you can add that right hand uh, version of it. And that usually helps to stabilize it, but just pay attention to how it changes the pitch. You just kind of have to figure out what works for you. On some bassoons, certain fingerings work differently. So that's another common discussion I'm having with students related to the E flat is which E flat fingering to use. And it boils down to what works the best for you. The next topic that I commonly come across with students is half holes. So half holes are opening the first tone hole in your left hand with your left index finger. And you're generally opening those half holes for what I like to call the three G's. G natural, G flat, or it's also called F sharp, and then G sharp, also called A flat. And those three G's, those, that would be at the top of the bass clef staff, and then also actually the octave above that, um, if you're playing up in the high register, but we'll, we'll kind of stick to the top of the bass clef staff. Those notes in that register of the, of the bass clef staff use half holes, and there's a specific way of how you should open the half holes, and there's actually some slight differences between those three notes of how much half hole to open. So a common issue that I see with students in half holes is how they are opening the half hole. I will sometimes see students lift their finger and then open the half hole. I will sometimes see students just sort of slide straight down and open the half hole that way. That's close, but it's not quite the motion we're looking for. Um, and I've seen other variations of those things. The most efficient way to open the half hole is actually sort of a rocking motion. So we're looking at the first tone hole that I normally use to open the half hole. So the, the motion that you want to go for is kind of like a rocking motion. I'm not really sliding and I'm not lifting or doing any other weird motion. I'm just sort of rocking my first finger open. And one thing to keep in mind is where on your finger you're pressing down that hole. If you look at my finger here, you can see where on my finger I press down. You can see that where I press down on the tone hole is more on sort of the side of my finger, not right in the, the meaty part of the finger. The reason for that is the half hole so that I can quickly open up that half hole and I'm not having to move a big portion of my finger. Related to how you're opening the half hole is how much you're opening it for. So F sharp or G flat, remember the three G's are the notes that we use those half holes on. That's gonna have the most tone hole open, the most open hole. So it's gonna be maybe more like only a quarter of the hole is closed. So you're gonna open up more. For G natural itself, that's about a half hole, an actual half hole of the tone hole. For G sharp or A flat, that is going to have just a peak of daylight open to, to open the tone hole. So that maybe only a quarter of the hole is open. So think the lower the note, the more open the hole is, the higher note, the less open it is. If you can kind of think that relationship between them, you'll especially notice, for example, if you try to open the hole too much on the A flat or G sharp, the bassoon might squeak at you or make some other weird noise because you opened it too much. So it only needs just a tiny bit. And the same thing happens for the, the octave above too. A lot of this stuff that we're talking about, that applies to that upper octave where you have to be um, really nuanced about how you're opening the half hole. It's never just a straight up half hole. And of course it changes from bassoon to bassoon. So if you're playing on one bassoon and it acts a certain way, and then you move to another bassoon, you might need to make adjustments in how you're opening the half holes to adjust for how the bassoon operates. One other really common issue that happens with half holes is just using them in general. A really good exercise to understand how half holes work is to do octave slurs 
between the half whole notes that we were just talking about and the octave below. So G at the bottom of the staff to G at the top of the staff, slurring between those two notes and you'll understand the, the relationship between them. If you try to play the G at the top of the staff and it's kind of squawking at you or it doesn't speak right away, you probably, one, either didn't open the half hole or you didn't open it at the exact instance that you needed to tongue. So it, you have to make sure not only that you're opening the half hole to the right amount, you need to make sure that you're opening it the instant you want the note to speak because they have to line up. You can also watch out for another common issue is, you know, we typically focus on this top left hand finger to, to be in control of the half hole notes. Sometimes doing this motion will cause one of these two fingers, the other two fingers in your left hand to move as well so that one of the other tone holes gets open and we don't want those to open. So even if you think your half hole finger, your index finger is doing everything correctly, pay attention to your other fingers because maybe they might be opening up a tone hole slightly and that might be causing an issue too. So there's lots to think about with half holes. Uh, everything that I just talked about are things that, these are discussions I feel like I have almost weekly with all my students. I talk about it with beginners. I talk about it also with really advanced students as well. It's kind of a thing that we're always dealing with. This is half full business. So the final topic I'm gonna to talk about regarding fingering nuances and fingering issues that we have as bassoonists uh, is something called venting and flicking. This can be a can of worms type of topic, depending on who you talk to, but flicking is a technique. It's a pretty advanced technique. You don't usually learn it until you've been playing the bassoon for a while, and you usually don't learn it unless you're studying with a private teacher, but it, it's a technique where you're flicking um, the keys on the wing joint in your left thumb open to vent basically the pad open so that the note speaks. So if you remember back to my discussion about how the whisper key is sort of the opposite octave key, flicking is a thing that bassoonists do to make certain upper notes speak in place of having like a register key or an octave key. Those notes are A, B flat, B natural, C, and sometimes D. I like to call that sort of the tenor register of the bassoon. It's not really the middle register and it's not really the high register. It's kind of that in-between transitional area of the bassoon and that can be a tricky range for a lot of students. And so, so flicking is where you're actually just pressing the key open right when you want to play the note. I don't want to get into all of that because that is a whole other video by itself and really it's something that can try to self teach yourself but I highly recommend that you try to get in a lesson with a teacher who can kind of walk you through how to learn it. It's easy to get very frustrated with it. You might have noticed that those notes don't tend to speak very well when you play them if you aren't putting anything down with your left thumb. Maybe they kind of squawk at you or um, they don't speak right away or they're they don't feel good to play essentially um, and that's because you're not flicking them if you aren't doing that and so what i do um, to teach beginners and people who aren't quite ready to start flicking yet i teach venting which is basically holding the key down for the duration of the note venting the note makes the note speak right away, but it does make the note sound airier and it does change the pitch. On some bassoons, it just flat out doesn't sound good at all. I recommend if you aren't flicking yet, you try venting because it's a good way to make sure those notes speak and it's a good way to start training your thumb to associate those keys with the with those notes so essentially you're holding down the keys that you would flick if you were flicking you're just holding them down or venting them and that opens up a vent on the wing joint so that the note speaks if we're looking at the wing joint um remember this is the whisper key the key above it is the c sharp key you're only going to use that for c sharp or d flat when you play the a at the top of the bass clef staff i recommend that you press down this key while you play a and then on B flat, B natural, and C at the top of the bass clef staff, just above it, I recommend down for each of those notes, every time you play them, that you play, you hold down this key. That's, this is the fourth one up from 
the whisper key. And then uh, I don't I don't recommend that you vent D. Um, sometimes when you're flicking, uh, you might flick this fifth key up, which you may not even have this fifth key on your bassoon. Not all bassoons have this key, um, but but basically, if you're venting, there there's only four notes to worry about: A at the top of the bass clef staff, and then B flat, B natural, and C. So I recommend that every time you play those notes, you just hold those keys down, um, especially if you feel like you're dealing with those notes not speaking, you're worried about them coming out. Um, I remember when I started playing bassoon in high school and I didn't have a teacher and I just felt like a complete failure because nobody was there telling me that you can just hold those keys down. I didn't even know what venting or flicking was. I was just trying to sort of overblow the notes and pl be it, play those notes basically the same fingering as the octave below without the whisper key and it wasn't working for me. If you're struggling with those notes, don't feel bad. It's it's a common issue. If you think that you might be interested in getting into flicking, I might do a video specifically on flicking later on. Comment down below if you're interested in a video on flicking. Um, I Again, I don't recommend it unless you're either working with a private teacher or you know, you're at an advanced enough point in your bassoon playing where um, it's becoming an issue to just hold those keys down. If this video was helpful for you, please give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel and let me down, know down in the comments, what fingerings are you struggling with or what fingerings have you had to sort of overcome to get better at the bassoon? I'm curious to know what sorts of things you've struggled with and if there's anything else I can help out with in the future.